Welcome. In this segment, we'll, we will be discussing the immune system. So this is going to be part of our animal form and function series. And the immune system is incredibly important, as important of our, as our digestive system, our circulatory system, and all of our other uh, important organ systems. So let's go to the slide here and take a look. So protection uh, for against invaders can be via barriers, and we'll talk about some of the barriers that our uh, body has against invaders, as well as through our immune system. And just to define immunity, immunity is the ability of our body to recognize and protect against non-self invaders. And it's similar to the SARS reaction that we ended the last segment with. So this immune system is dispersed throughout our body and it is crucial to survival, again, as crucial to survival as many of our other major body systems. All animals must defend against invaders, against invading foreign agents. It's also extremely important to parasitic animals, those that must overcome our defenses in order to uh, become, uh, so that we may be a host for them. Immunity can be divided into innate immunity as well as adaptive immunity. Immunity uh, is based on, both of these particular systems are based on molecular recognition of a non-self invader. Innate defenses are those that are always present or activate immediately upon infection, and these are the same regardless of the pathogen and whether or not it has been encountered before. Adaptive defenses, on the other hand, are activated when immune cells in the body with re particular receptor molecules on them on the cell surface bind specifically to molecules or antigens that are be being shed from the invaders. Calling them acquired in this next box here reflects the fact that, these are, that this immune response is enhanced by previous exposure. These types of defenses can be acquired passively, which is generally passed on from a mother to a child, or actively, where defenses are more robust if the invader has been encountered before. With this active immunity, this response can be triggered either through a natural exposure to a particular invader or artificially through vaccines, and this is what our vac vaccination program is based upon. So again, immunity is our ability to recognize and protect against non-self invaders. When you think about a susceptible organism, these are ones that are unable to eliminate an invader before it becomes established. Whereas a resistant uh, organism is able to prevent establishment and survival of a particular invader. And this ability depends on many things, including our genetics, are the environment that we're actually in, as well as our current state of health, okay? So, there, our first line of defense, an animal's first line of defense, is going to be the integumentary system. And this is going to include barriers, such as our skin and our mucous membranes. Our second line of defense is our innate immune system. And that's that rapid chemical and cellular response where we, our immune system is able to recognize particular invaders based on conserved proteins of the pathogens. The third line of defense is the adaptive or acquired immunity. And with these, the invaders are recognized, but it's predicated on a prior infection, okay? So from there, let's talk about some of the physical and chemical barriers to the invaders. The first one are the surface barriers, these can include the exoskeleton of insects. It also includes our epidermis, as well as the mucous membranes that line our, um, our, our respiratory tract. Um, some of our defenses include uh, emitting antimicrobials or defensins. So these are molecules that protect against invaders. And when you think of insects in particular, with their open circulatory system, if an invader is able to breach that particular barrier, they release a barrage of these antimicrobial defenses in response to a microbial pathogen. Another barrier is low pH. So 
Some of the, our open systems have a, a low pH to actually uh, prevent establishment of invaders. And when you think of these sort of uh, systems, this would be our stomach. So our digestive system has uh, a low pH, as well as um, in females, the vagina. And there's also hydrolytic enzymes that are present in the alimentary tract, and these are protective as well. So enzymes are also helpful. Um, there's lysozymes, which is an enzyme found in tears, and these can attack the cell wall of many bacteria, and so this is a pr protective mechanism in our eyes. We have mucus present in the membranes lining the digestive tract and the respiratory tract, again, and these um, can contain parasitic parasitical substances. Um, another line of defense that animals have is the ability to initiate a fever. And a fever is a common symptom of infection in animals. And these, we think, um, cause destabilization of viruses and bacteria. Another um, set of uh, things that help protect us are our symbiotic relationships. So we have symbionts within our digestive tract, within our reproductive tract, and when these are present, it act their presence keeps other invaders from establishing. So there's this competition between our symbionts and any potential invaders that may be present. Okay, so these can inhibit pathogenic, pathogenic microbes. Another um, uh, barrier is breast milk, or another chemical barrier is breast milk, and these can kill some intestinal protozoans, and these are helpful with nursing infants. There's also antimicrobial elements in milk, including lysozymes, defensins, and leukocytes. So breast milk is extremely important, especially for, for small, uh, for infants. Encapsulation is another mechanism that provides a defense. This is the process of forming a capsule around an invader. This is quite common in insects where you have an invader come into that open circulatory system and they will be encapsulated. Phagocytosis is another line of defense and this involves recognition of non-self materials. It also clears aging cells and cellular debris. So phagocytes, we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, are large white blood cells that engulf and destroy non-self invaders. Okay, so the integumentary system again is one, our first line of defense and our skin happens to be the largest organ of the body. It forms an, an impenetrable barrier with chemical weapons. You never thought about that probably. Um, but the oils that our skin excretes as well as our sweat can be um, defensive against invaders. The, our skin, or um, the pH, the oil and the sweat glands give the skin a pH of uh, three to five, so it's fairly acidic. And the sweat also contains lysozymes that break down bacterial cell walls. Our skin also has a complement of natural flora that is present, and again, this can outcompete pathogens that might want to establish, and also they can secrete antimicrobials. So very helpful, so having our normal flora is important. And here's um, the example of our integumentary, integumentary system, so with our skin being the largest organ of our body. We also have these mucos mucosal epithelial surfaces, and along that, those epithelial surfaces you have cells that secrete mucus. This mucus can actually um, trap microbes that are present. Um, and these line the digestive, respiratory, and urogenital tracts, or reproductive tracts. The digestive tract is also a particularly unwelcoming environment for invaders. Um, the salivary glands produce lysosomes that uh, work against invaders. The stomach has hydrochloric acid that lowers the pH to around 2. Not a lot of things are able to survive at that low of a pH. Um, the respiratory tract also secretes mucus which is swept out along with invaders via ciliary action. So here's an example of this where you have ciliary action on, the, on a mucosal surface here. So we have cilia that line our respiratory tract 
and again these are constantly sweeping out invaders um, and the, our digestive tract also has a normal complement of flora and we're actually reading a paper regarding this in a, for one of our homeworks and you'll see that establishment early on just after birth or during the birth process is incredibly important for a functioning digestive system as well as our immune system so it's it's very tightly um, tied together there okay so again here's an example examples of mucosal epithelial surfaces here you've got these columnar cells with goblet cells interspersed here um, that are lining the digestive tract um, again, the respiratory tract has ciliary action, sweeping out mucus and invaders. The urogenital tract has acidic urine, again, which is working against uh, invaders, as is the reproductive tract. So there's secretions from the reproductive tract that exhibit, uh, that cause acidic conditions. There are also symbiotic bacteria present, one of which is lactobacillus, which is the same that is used to make yogurt, cheese, and beer, and wine. So and we have a lactobacillus that is symbiotic with humans. It's found in the vagina and facilitates an acidic environment as well as inhibiting the growth of invading microbes. And for those of you who have been on females that have been on antibiotics, you've noticed that when you take antibiotics, you can also reduce the number of your um, symbiotic flora that are present, which can then cause a yeast infection, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago in regards to um, when we were talking about fungi. All right, so again, here's some, some visuals of looking at the cilia. You have these pseudostratified columnar cells that are present within the respiratory tract. Mucus is being secreted and then it's being swept away by cilia. The lymphatic or immune system is um, incredibly important. So the primary organs of the lymphatic and immune system include the thymus and the red bone marrow. So here's a visual of this. So the primary lymphatic Im and immune system includes the thymus as well as the red bone marrow. And this is where our white blood cells originate and or mature. And our white blood cells are incredibly important to our immune response. Secondary organs include lymph nodes, tonsils, and the spleen. And so here's where these are present. So the, the tonsils as well as the spleen. And then you have uh, a couple of places where you have lymph nodes present, including down here around your hips, as well as near underneath your arms and cervical lymph nodes up in your neck. Okay. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the leukocytes. So these are our soldiers within our immune system, basically. These form in the red bone marrow from pluripotent cells, most mature and are released into the circulatory system from the red bone marrow. And these are going to include B cells, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And B cells are lymphocytes that are critical, uh, are a critical component of the adaptive immune response. Lymphatic T cells travel to the thymus and they mature there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. And here are actual examples. So again, you have the pluripotent stem cells that are present within the red bone marrow. And these can differentiate um, into these stem cells. And from there, you can have these progenitor cells. And you'll see that this is also where it gives rise to red blood cells. So here's your urethrocytes. And then on the other side, uh, you have platelets. Platelets are also an important uh, component of the immune response, and we'll talk about them in just a few minutes. But platelets are derived from these megakerocytes. And then when you go over to this side here, you've got the progenitor cells, and these are going to give rise to the granulocytes, the sinophils the basophils and the neutrophils, as well as the monocytes. And these monocytes are going to be the ones that are primarily um, doing the, the phagocytosis. You also have lymphoid stem cells that are present, so within some of the lymph tissues. 
and these are what's going to be producing the B cells and we'll see in just a minute with the, the immune response that B cells give rise to plasma cells as well as memory cells. Natural killer cells are another important component of our immune response and these are from lymphoid tim, uh, stem cells as well as our T cells. Okay, So just an overview of the white blood cells that are present and are important within our immune system. Okay, so let's talk more specifically about innate immunity again. Innate immunity is the nonspecific uh, or innate immune system response, which is, consists of cellular and chemical responses to an infection via recognition of conserved proteins. And this is uh, usually a rapid response to any microbial infection. And it's predicated on these conserved proteins that are present on the exterior of invaders. Okay, this response is um, via three avenues. The first is through elimination. So elimination or removal or destruction of an invader. This is via phagocytosis, which we'll talk more about in just a few minutes. It's uh, conducted by macrophages as well as natural killer cells. It can be via pathogen destruction, release of interferons, which causes destructions of the microbial invader as well as cell death. Okay, another avenue is through an inflammation response, which we'll talk about, as well as a complement response. So here's an example of phagocytosis, so a response via monocytes, where you get a pathogen that is phagocytized, and a vacuole forms around them, lysozymes or enzymes or are uh, secreted into this vacuole and then the pathogen is destroyed. So specifically you have granulocytes that are present that help with this, uh, this phagocytosis and destruction of invaders. The three kinds of granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils as well as these mast cells that are associated with them. Neutrophils are, uh, they kill invaders by phagocytosis. They are the most abundant leukocytes, so the most abundant white blood cells present within our, our immune system. And they are the first to appear, so they're those soldiers that immediately respond to an invader. The next are the eosinophils, and eosinophils congregate um, near invasions. These are normally associated with um, allergic diseases and parasitic infections. So if you're not feeling well and you go to your doctor and he suspects a parasitic infection, the first thing he'll do is ask you, have you visited a foreign country? And if you say yes, they'll immediately take blood and try to figure out if you have a high eosinophil count. If you do, then that's an indication of a parasitic infection that you probably picked up on your, your trip or your vacation. Okay, so a high eosinophil count associated with allergic diseases and parasitic infections. The last here are the basophils, and these release substances that affect surrounding cells. So histamines, which call, cause uh, inflammation and lead to an inflammatory response. There are also mast cells that are located underneath mucus secreting surfaces, and these can also release histamines and initiate this, uh, this inflammatory response. Monocytes are big eaters, so, or macrophages, and these are out there that are, they're large, irregularly shaped cells that mature from monocytes, that enter tissues from the blood, and these are ones that are uh, killing microbes by phagocytosis, um, as well as the, the neutrophils. And here's what some of these look like. So here's an eosinophil, again, uh, associated with a parasitic disease or an allergic disease. The basophils, which are releasing substances that initiate uh, the inflammatory response. And then here's neutrophils and monocytes, both of which are um, undergoing phagocytosis. And this is a really, really neat video. If you click on this and watch this to see or use this URL, to see a white blood cell that's chasing a bacteria and then engulfing it. So it's a really, a really nice example, visual example of how this happens. Okay, the next group are the natural killer cells. 
And these kill virus infected and tumor cells in the absence of antibodies. So these are the, the cells within the immune system that are really important for fighting viral diseases as well as um, tumors, so cancer. And these originate from the lymphoid cells as I showed earlier. And again, destroy pathogen infected and tumor cells by causing programmed cell death or apoptosis. Okay, so they secrete proteins that insert themselves into the target cell's membrane which then causes the destruction. So here's an example of this. Here's a natural killer cell that's attaching to a target cell that is either a tumor cell or a virally infected cell. Once it attaches, it releases these enzymes that cause programmed cell death. So it inserts this, this protein in and then releases these, these enzymes that cause it to die. From there, a macrophage will come along and, and clean things up. All right. You also have interferons. There's three major types of interferons, and these proteins play a key role in the innate response. The first is the alpha and beta interferons. These are produced by almost all body cells in response to a viral infection, and they induce degradation of viral RNA. Gamma, uh, so here's the, so the cell death, so when you, when you degrade the, the RNA of the virus, then that's going to halt protein production, and that will um, cause the cell death, so the viruses do not replicate and infect other cells. With the, the interferon, the gamma interferons, these are produced only by T lymphocytes and natural killer cells, and these protect from infection and cancer. Okay, so here's some examples here of expression of these, these gamma interferons within insects and some examples here of, of cancer cells and that you have these other cells, these interferons that are protecting the, uh, the body from these. Okay, so produced by T lymphocytes and natural killer cells. So the next is the inflammatory response. Inflammation includes, involves various body systems. Injured cells produce uh, chemical alarms, including the histamines and prostaglandins. So histamines are produced by those basophils and mast cells that we talked about a few minutes ago. And when these are released, it causes nearby blood vessels to dilate and increase in permeability. When they increase in permeability, that allows other uh, leukocytes to come to the site of the infection, infection in order to help. For, so the neutrophils will show up and they'll undergo phagocytosis and, and um, if it's a cut, they'll take out anything that has come in through that cut, through that opening within that epidermal layer. Um, it also, and so it, the inflammatory response um, causes phagocyte accumulation near the site of the injury. Another mechanism of the inflammatory response is to induce fever. So the hypothalamus, which we'll learn later, raises the body temperature. It promotes the activity of when you increase the body temperature and you induce a fever, then that's going to promote activity of the phagocytes. And it will also impede microbial growth. So we know that too hot is hazardous um, and it may be harmful. But you have to have this balance here because the fever is also there to denature some of the critical enzymes of the, the invaders as well. Okay, Hallmark signs of the inflammatory response include redness and swelling, as well as warmth, that induction of the, of the fever, as well as pain and potential loss of function. So here's an injury that occurs. Bacteria and other, um, other things are introduced into um, your, your, your uh, tissues. So it's a breach of that, that first line of defense. And so you have increased permeability. These chemical signals are released by the mast cells and basophils are then going to bring in some of these neutrophils and the monocytes, which will um, phagocytize the bacteria in any of the invaders that have gotten in. Okay, so the complement system. The complement system consists of about 30 different proteins circulating in the blood. 
in inactive forms. Upon, a path, uh, upon encounter with a pathogen, it triggers a cascade of events. So, including one that's called um, the membrane attack complex. So, this is made up of proteins that aggregate to form this uh, complex that inserts itself into the pathogen's plasma membrane, and that will form a pore. And via that pore, fluid will enter and cause the pathogen to basically swell and burst. So let's see how this happens. So you have proteins that, that congregate and then insert themselves into the plasma membrane of the invader, and that will cause um, fluid to enter and the pathogen to swell and burst. So it'll tag the invading pathogen for phagocytosis as well. So then you will get the release of histamines from the basophils and attract more phagocytes to this particular area. So that wraps up our innate immune response and we're going to now start talking about the adaptive or, and or acquired immune response. So that innate immunity is a mechanism of defense that does not depend on prior exposure, whereas this particular immunity is predicated on prior exposure to a specific uh, pathogen, so to a particular non-self material, and it requires time to develop. And again, vaccinations are based on this adaptive uh, acquired immunity. Passive immunity is that which is passed um, from, so this is a vertical transmission from a mother to an offspring or to a child. And so when uh, a placental organism is born, um, it has its mother's antibodies present which is going to help defend them from early invaders until their own immune system develops and matures. Um, these antibodies can pass through the placenta. It can also be ingested through breast milk, which we talked about just a few minutes ago. But this is a temporary immune response, and so this will degrade through time as those antibodies are broken down. So this, uh, again, is, is only temporary. Active immunity, again, is where you have this necessary exposure, and from there, your immune system can respond much more quickly and vigorously on a secondary exposure. These can be through natural exposures as well as artificial exposures, and again, our vaccination programs are based on this. The scientific study of immunity began with Edward Jenner in, in 1796. He observed that milkmaids who had cowpox, which is a kind of infection uh, from cows, um, and when milkmaids are exposed to cows that have been infected with cowpox, they actually had lower, uh, they rarely experienced smallpox. And because of this, he started developing ways to immunize people against uh, smallpox. So the first vaccination that he developed for this, it was basically exposing um, people to the cowpox vaccine. And his first person that he exposed happened to be his, his own child. And so I'm sure that was something that he had to, to get by his wife. But, um, but it worked. And from there, you had uh, this first development of vaccinations you probably wouldn't get by with that today. The next work that was on uh, working with vaccinations uh, was by Louis Pasteur, and so not much happened for many, many years until Louis Pasteur absentmindedly left a container of avian cholera bacteria on a shelf while he went for a vacation, a two-week vacation. So he had been working with avian cholera and working with poultry, and he went on vacation, he left his bottle on the shelf, he came back, resumed his experiments, and when he inoculated poultry with his on-the-shelf uh, cholera, they didn't experience uh, a, the disease. They only became mildly ill. So he was like, okay, I'll get some new fresh bacteria. And he went out and got fresh bacteria, and he tried to inoculate them with this fresh bacteria, and nothing happened at that point. So he had found that they had become immune by inoculating them with that 
old uh, bacteria. And being a fairly bright fellow, Louis, um, put two and two together and concluded that infection with the old weakened bacteria conferred immunity. And from there, you had a very, uh, a very quick uh, response with vaccinations. Okay, so that, that's really what, what started the vaccination programs here. All right, so the acquired re immune response is predicated on antigens. And antigens are foreign substances that are found on the exterior of invaders that stimulate an immune response. So when you have these, these proteins that are present on the outside of an invader, and then if you blow that up and look at it over here, these can be very specific to a particular invader. And so these are usually um, substances with a molecular weight of over 3,000, and they are usually proteins found on the surfaces of microorganisms. They can also be on the surfaces of red blood cells and or transplanted tissues, which can result in rejection of tissues and or reactions if you have to receive blood. Again, these antigens may have many different epitopes or these surfaces available for binding, but they can be recognized. Um, and here's an up close of some of these antigen binding sites on particular white blood cells. So lymphocytes, including B lymphocytes, B cells, and T lymphocytes, or T cells, these, uh, these receptor areas are critical in acquired immunity. So the receptor proteins on the surface of B cells have antigen binding sites. These receptor sites have two identical light chains on the outside and uh, two identical heavy chains forming a Y shape where these antigens bind. Okay, so right in here. These B cells have approximately 100,000 antigen receptors on each cell and there are millions of B cells produced by our immune system. So you can imagine the number of these receptor sites that are present on all of those different B cells. You also have T cells and T cells have receptors that are transmembrane proteins, and these bi also bind with specific antigens, okay? So receptor proteins present on our uh, B cells and T cells are extremely important in um, this immune response, in this acquired immune response. There's also a very important uh, molecule that's present or, or structure that's present called the major histocompatibility complex, or the MHC complex. Discovery of this particular uh, part of the immune system response um, was uh, a chemist and or a physiologist that found that this was important, and it, uh, it resulted in him receiving a Nobel Prize for this particular discovery of this complex. So when a pathogen invades, cells will present antigen fragments on their surface via this, this major histocompatibility complex, which then binds to T cells. So here's this binding here to the T cells. And this will activate T cells to secrete cytokines. And so these cytokines that are secreted by the T cells are how the cells of immunity communicate. So these are, are um, compounds that dissolve into fluid, but they mediate cell communication here. Once that the T cells in the, the, uh, the pathogen has been ingested here, these cytokines are produced, and then this is going to mediate this immune response. Okay, then B cells will be induced to ramp up their, hum their humoral immunity and cytotoxic T cells indicated here will, um, will, will undergo the cell-mediated immunity. And so we'll talk about both of these on the next few slides. Humoral immunity, again, the cytokines produced by helper T cells cause B cells to differentiate into plasma and memory cells. This plasma, uh, the plasma cells will be um, producing antibodies and these antibodies will mediate the invader's destruction. Antibodies are identical in organization to B cell receptors, and so they will bind to antigens on the invaders and will mark them for destruction. And again, this process 
is what uh, protective vaccines are mediated on. I have a previous video that is available on YouTube. I would greatly encourage all of you to go to this website on the SUNY ESF TV channel and watch this video. So it will take you through a very um, explicit drawing of this particular humoral immunity response. Okay, so here's what you will end up drawing based on that video. And this is where you actually see an invader that comes in to uh, a body and it's shedding these antigens. These antigens bind to these receptor sites on a B cell. This B cell becomes sensitized. From there, it is activated. And here you'll also see part of this is uh, predicated on the invader being phagocytized in this initiation of the MHC complex and these helper T cells producing these cytokinines, which will induce the B cells to multiply and then grow and differentiate. Some of these B cells will become memory cells and memory cells are what um, causes a very rapid response upon second exposure. So there's thousands of these memory cells that are produced. Some of them will differentiate into plasma cells. These plasma cells will secrete antibodies and then these antibodies will tag the invader for phagocytosis. Okay, so a very important process here. There are many more memory cells in the body than the original B cells that had those particular receptor proteins. And so when these uh, memory cells encounter the antigen produced by a particular invader again, they will rapidly multiply to produce a lot of plasma cells, which will then produce the antibodies. So here's the amount of antibodies. Sorry, finding my mouse here. Here's the amount of antibodies on the y-axis when you're originally exposed, so this is an example of exposure to cowpox, you have this initial increase, this primary response, and then this number will go down. However, those memory cells are still present, and then upon exposure to cowpox again, the secondary response is much, much, much larger than the, the primary response was, okay? So this is the acquired humoral immune response. The other direction is the cell-mediated immunity, and these are via cytotoxic T cells. And these cytotoxic T cells induce apoptosis or programmed cell death of altered self cells. So these are either virally infected cells or cancer cells. Naive um, cytotoxic T cells are activated by dendritic cells which then undergo clonal division and differentiate into activated cells. And these then um, can target altered cells causing apoptosis and or memory cells that can persist within the, the immune system. And so here's an example of this process happening um, where you get um, a virus that is engulfed by a dendritic cell. You've got another MHC complex that is present and then you have production of these, these cytotoxic T cells, and some of them will become memory cytotoxic T cells, some of them will be activated and will be out there destroying altered T cells, okay? There can be problems within our immune system. So some of these immune response problems are, um, include allergies. So allergies are exaggerated responses to certain antigens. So our immune system can um, have exaggerated responses to things such as grass pollen and or bee stings. So those uh, persons in particular who are very allergic to bee stings, that's really an overreaction of your immune system to a particular antigen that is received via that sting. There are also autoimmune diseases, and these are where the recognition of self and non-self fail. So your immune system isn't able to differentiate between non-self and self. Um, immune responses uh, generally develop over time and all substances present at the time the capacity develops are recognized as self later in life. 
And again, sometimes this process is not perfect. So when this system fails, you can get severe diseases. One of them, so examples include rheumatoid arthritis, where the immune system attacks your own joints. And this can develop, um, some of it in older persons. Multiple sclerosis is another example where our immune system attacks our central nervous system. Lupus is where um, our immune system attacks our body cells and tissues. Diabetes mellitus type 1 is where our insulin producing cells of the pancreas are destroyed by our own immune system. And then the last here is Crohn's disease where you get chronic inflammation and this is usually affecting the intestines. So again, these are examples of autoimmune diseases. Um, acquired immunity deficiency syndrome or AIDS, which is mediated by a virus, so the human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV targets T cells and destroys T cells, which we've already seen how important T cells are in the humoral response. So this is a very important um, disease. It's often, it's a terminal disease, but it's not from the virus itself. It's usually from another viral or microbial or parasitic infection, which our body cannot respond to or fight because the T cells have been destroyed. Um, and production of an effective vaccine is proven difficult as this particular virus mutates to produce many different strains during the progress of an actual infection. Here's some examples of the autoimmune diseases. So lupus is one. Um, this rheumatoid arthri arthritis is another one. So, so different examples of this. So evading the immune system. Some pathogens can alter their surface antigens to avoid immune system detection. So we saw some of these antigenic shifts in viruses, and that's why flu vaccines often do not work. So the influenza virus expresses two different surface proteins. You can get what's called antigenic drift, where small G mutations occur, resulting in different epitopes so that our immune system does not recognize it. Or you can get an antigenic shift with a, or a large mutation where um, you have different surface proteins that are being produced. A couple of other examples, let me see if that's on this slide. A couple of other examples include uh, tuberculosis, so mycobacterium tuberculosis, once phagocytized. So it gets phagocytized by a white blood cell, but then it inhibits fusion of the phagosome, so the vacuole with the lysosomes. And so it actually is able to take over that, that white blood cell. So it inhibits the, the white blood cell from, from destroying it. Another one is uh, gonorrhea. So Neisseria gonorrhea secretes proteases that degrade antibodies. So even though your immune system responds, the, uh, the invader is secreting enzymes that are degrading the antibodies so that the antibodies can't tag the invader for destruction. There's a couple of things that we can do in order to help support our immune system. There's uh, an hypothesis out there called the hygiene hypothesis, where it is thought that people that are exposed to more viruses and pathogens when they are young actually um, causes their immune system to be robust, more robust later in life. So that's the hy hygiene hypothesis, where if you're raised on a farm or you have pets and you're exposed to some of these things, that you're, you will have a stronger immune system and you will be less susceptible to um, allergies and that sort of thing. And then of course there are things that you can do to support your immune system. So getting enough exercise, um, getting enough sleep, and then of course eating a lot of good foods for you. Vitamin C is gone back and forth as to its benefits regarding supporting the immune system. Um, other things are don't stress, which I know is really hard, especially during the end of the semester. Um, and then getting vitamin D, so getting out in the sunshine and getting production of vitamin D is also thought to be helpful with supporting the immune system. And so here's just some visuals of some of these things that you can do in order to stay healthy and happy and to end the semester in, in, a, in a strong fashion. Um, these particular tables, 
again, are just an emphasis on some of these different cells of the immune system. So it's a nice visual here showing the, the different kinds of cells. So you have these uh, helper T cells and their function, cytotoxic T cells, as well as B cells. And then we know that B cells can differentiate into plasma cells and memory cells. And then you also have natural killer cells. So these are lymphocytes. And then you have um, the cells that are produced in the red bone marrow, and these include the, the macrophages, these monocytes, as well as neutrophils, the granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And then you also have these mast cells and these dendritic cells, which again, the dendritic cells and their production of that major histocompatibility compatibility complex won uh, a fellow the Nobel Prize in 2011. So with this, I hope that this has been um, helpful and that you're able to use some of this material and to learn a little bit about yourself and how to um, support your immune system and to stay a little bit healthier. Okay? And that's all for now. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.